I, I'm super appreciative of you accepting our request to speak. Um, um, this is going to be a treat for us. Anne is, I'll give you a little background on Anne. Uh, uh, she's a native of uh, uh, Pennsylvania, um, did a lot of her, did all of her undergraduate work in Massachusetts. She got a math and physics degree at MIT. And then she went down the river, down the road to Harvard, where she got her PhD in astronomy and mas master's and PhD. Um, she then uh, did some postgraduate work out at uh, University of California. And uh, then very shortly thereafter went to where she currently resides as a professor at the University of Arizona. And I think you've been there for like 20 some odd years now, if I'm not mistaken, right? That's correct, yes. Yeah, so she has uh, done amazing things. If you look at her publications and, the, and her background, it's, it's totally amazing. Um, and I chose this photo though, because I think, Anne, with all of your um, spectacular work, what, what impresses me is that you're able to reach the most junior scientists that we have and sit down with them and do education and outreach uh, at that level too. So um, uh, totally rounded uh, astronomer, we're super excited to have you here. And uh, we're eager to get involved and help uh, help you with gravitational waves, but you have to tell us what those are first. That's the only <laughs> downside. So, and I'll turn it over to you, Anne. Well, thank you very much for that gracious, uh, thoughtful introduction. It's a pleasure for me to have a chance to speak to all of you today. Uh, let me just work on sharing my screen with you. Um, one moment, please. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak uh, with all of you today, and, and thanks for the invitation. Um, I wanted to tell you um, a little bit about something you may be already familiar with uh, called the Legacy Survey of Space and Time uh, that is nicknamed LSST. Does anyone know what uh, telescope that is in the lower left part of the screen? Let's see if you can see my cursor. Yes, you can. Good. Um, I'm pointing to it. It has an 8.4 meter mirror and it's currently being constructed in Chile in a very impressive and unique enclosure down there. Um, yes, well, I'm not seeing any hands raised. That's that's fine. Um, Is there a, Rubin? Is there a Rubin Observatory? It's the Rubin Observatory. Yeah, the, Rubin Observatory. The Vera Rubin Observatory, named after Vera Rubin. And um, this new legacy survey of space and time. Uh, will be conducted on it. The remarkable thing about the Rubin telescope, um, whose original design came actually from the University of Arizona in our mirror lab here, is that it has a whopping three and a half degree field of view. And as you know, that's more than 40 times the area of the full moon on the sky. And the objective is to complete a survey of the entire night sky, at least in the Southern hemisphere, every three days. So the extraordinary, aspect of this telescope is that it is going to be uh, have create access to a new discovery space for for astronomy in that it will be detecting explosions and other violent happenings uh, both inside and outside our galaxy every night to the tune of around 10 million alerts per night um, and so for the first time, we're really talking about making a movie of the night sky in multiple filters, not just having snapshots. And over 10 years, um, that, those detections of things that actually change in the course of the movie will be studied and analyzed and include things like supernovae of different flavors, um, things called tidal disruption events, which you see in the upper left here in an artist's conception and also kind of going in one of my ears and out another of my ears. <laughs> and that's a, that's a star that has wandered too close to the central supermassive black hole in a galaxy and is being spaghettified, tidally disrupted by it. Um, the, the middle picture here, if you can see my cursor, is again an artist rendition of a, of a supernova event. Um, and um, the third picture to the to the lower right is a an artist's rendition of a of a binary neutron star that has in spiraled and is merging as we witness it here, um, and that is called or can be called a kilonova if it produces 
and counterpart in electromagnetic radiation. One thing we do know that this last category of objects produces is gravitational waves. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but today I wanna to tell you about our efforts to deal with this fire hose of data from the Legacy Survey of Space and Time. And to also ultimately ask for your help in finding any light counterparts to these, these events where two neutron stars merge together and are detected as gravitational wave sources. So let me move on to showing you quickly, uh, and I'll come back to this as well, a picture of one of the two stations in North America of the LIGO gravitational wave detector. You can see there are two very long arms uh, that are perpendicular to one another to measure the flexing um, of the earth and just about everything as gravitational waves uh, pass through this neighborhood, originating in some cases with the mergers of these two neutron stars. So um, what I will ultimately get to is a citizen science project. I, you know, I never use, I, I say pro-am, but I, I use that term very much uh, with, with my tongue in cheek because I've seen many of your setups and I, there's nothing amateurish about anything that you folks are doing. So I prefer to say non-professional astronomers or, or citizen scientists. And this Hot Shots project is an opportunity perhaps for, for you to identify um, potential sources of gravitational waves detected by the LIGO experiment. All right, well, the first thing I wanna show you is a brief history of the detection of things that change in the night sky. And in particular, I wanted to talk about this extraordinary explosion of data. I referred to it a moment ago as a fire hose, whereby every night once the LSST project gets operating, we expect 10 million alerts Maybe a million of those are real and will be sifted out. Maybe hundreds and hundreds of thousands of those are real physical explosions or changes in galaxies outside of our own. And you can see right away that we have a down select problem in that there are hundreds of telescopes in the world that may be capable and available to follow up these sources at any time and yet we have way, way, way too many targets to assign, and these targets are changing. They fade. And so the question is, how do we prioritize which targets to take a hard look at and stay on and monitor at the expense of others? We don't want to miss any major discoveries, and we don't want to give short shrift to rare objects that we know very little about today. So what you see on the screen here is a plot of, of declination and right ascension, but this was the picture on the sky uh, in 1939 as to what kinds of changes over rapid timescales of days, sometimes hours or months or years, um, certain objects showed. And as I mentioned earlier, a lot of these are gonna be supernovae of different types. And what you see at the bottom in the legend are uh, point colors and point types indicating different types of supernovae. But I'm gonna start the movie here just so you can get a sense of how much we gained in ability to measure changes in the night sky over the course of years. And as you can see, this movie rapidly fast forwarded through to the late 90s where our ability to actually find transients, astrophysical transients in the sky really changed because there were a lot of surveys that were dedicated uh, for that purpose. But if you can imagine for a moment what this movie would look like in the LSST era, this would, the screen would almost be saturated with uh, colored points of various kinds, including some we may not have imagined yet. So up to 2018, which is where this movie ends, these were the kinds of objects that were being intermittently detected. Uh, many types of supernovae, even you can see GRB listed at the bottom, that stands for gamma ray burst. 
And you can see TDE, that stands for Tidal Destruction Event, the Spaghettification of Stars, Fast Radio Bursts, and you might have missed it because it went by the previous year, but there was a purple point for, entitled GW, <laughs> which um, is the gravitational wave source. So let me get back to that. Um, just a little more background, perhaps, on the kinds of objects that I will be talking about that we hope to detect with this survey. Um, I mentioned supernovae before, and as you know, uh, those are exploding stars, and they're very broadly classified into two main types, depending upon the kind of star that's doing the explosion, exploding. Um, the progenitors of so-called type 1a supernovae um, tend to be white dwarfs that are accreting matter from a binary companion, um, while the progenitors of so-called type 2 or core collapse supernovae are massive stars at their end of their lives. So that's a very, very different mechanism for producing the supernova. And there are tens, at least tens of subtypes with significant differences um, under each of those classes, and most are poorly understood. And as I mentioned um, earlier, we, we also have um, the special types of objects called gamma ray bursts, which as you can infer from the name, uh, were first detected as bursts of gamma rays, but are also detected in, at other wavelengths. And they are thought uh, to originate under the special conditions where an extremely massive core collapsing type supernova forms a black hole with a very powerful jet. And if that jet ends up pointed in our direction, um, we would see a burst of, of gamma rays. Um, we also tend to see if we monitor these objects for some time, um, afterglows at longer wavelengths, even into optical wavelengths, uh, from successive shocks as this jet impacts surrounding medium. So there may have been earlier winds produced by this star or an environment in which it formed and this jet is shocking that. The average burst duration um, for a gamma ray burst in gamma rays tends to be about 30 seconds uh, for these objects. But the kilonovae that I mentioned before that can form from the merger of two neutron stars in a binary pair uh, can produce a much shorter lived kind of gamma ray burst that lasts around um, 0.3 seconds. That's kind of the average for that population. And after the neutron stars are thought to merge, there's a lot of debris that is thrown off from that system. There are a lot of free neutrons. There's a lot of uh, nucleosynthesis. And the debris generates um, visible and infrared light afterglows um, from the decay of the radioactive elements that have been created. In, in this burst. So actually elements like platinum and gold um, are thought uh, in, in large measure to form from debris uh, from such mergers. And the burst of light that gets produced uh, is called a kilonova. And then I had mentioned one of my favorite classes of events, uh, which are tidal disruption events. And I'm just going back to what is now a, a computer simulation as opposed to an artist's conception of a star being spaghettified by a central supermassive black hole in a galaxy because it wandered too close and the differential uh, gravitational forces, the tides, were too strong and, and stripped that star apart. It ultimately forms or is thought to form an accretion disk of material, a, a disk of material that's extremely luminous across many wavelengths. Um, it's so hot it emits x-rays. Um, and that's just gas uh, orbiting in this disk waiting uh, to fall into the black hole and disappear past its event horizon. So um, I've told you about some of the major classes of objects that we expect to, to see in light. Uh, with the LSST survey. I'm going to get back to many of them later, but I want to take a slight detour and talk a little bit more about these tidal disruption events. I hope you'll understand the arc of my narrative um, a little further into the talk, um, because I'm going to tell you at first how I even got into this field, and it was kind of through the back door of, of, of understanding or trying to understand what kinds of galaxies hosted different kinds of things that 
change on human timescales like I was just showing you. Um, and by the time I got into that, I started getting into to these changes in the night sky and, and, and now I'm working on that. So um, let me let me take this detour to tell you a little bit about my origin story in this field <laughs> and uh, why it began with tidal disruption events. So um, one of the fascinating things about tidal disruption events is that they form in weird galaxies. Um, and what you're seeing in this image on the left is actually a Hubble Space Telescope picture of an entire galaxy. So you can imagine the scale in the image at the left is probably of order 10 kiloparsecs across. But what you're seeing you know, in this attempt to show you a, a zoom in, and I'll run the movie, is a simulation of a star approaching the central supermassive black hole in this galaxy. But the simulation on the right is on the scale of less than a parsec. So in this very image, if you compare the left panel to the right panel, we are going from 10 kiloparsecs across to something on parsec and subparsec scales on the right. And what you're seeing in the simulation on the right is what might happen to a star that wandered too close to the black hole and how its orbital structure and precession would change in time, ultimately forming a circular uh, accretion uh, disk of material around the black hole. But the reason I was stressing this huge dynamic range in uh, scales, uh, spatial scales, is because of the fact that for reasons we don't completely understand, tidal disruption events occur in these peculiar galaxies. And I'm going to tell you more about how peculiar these galaxies are and why they're interesting. But at the time I learned about tidal disruption events, I was studying these very peculiar galaxies. And when there turned out to be a connection between them and tidal disruption events, in fact, a strong preference, for tidal disruption events to occur in these galaxies, I was fascinated. Not just because I'm interested in those galaxies, but because I couldn't understand why there would be a connection between 10 kiloparsec scales and subparsec scales. I mean, why, why should the property of the galaxy in some way dictate a preference for a star to be disrupted by the black hole in its center, which is on this tiny scale, almost to be insignificant except for the star's nearby it. So let me show you some scientific data and, and what I mean by the host galaxies of tidal disruption events being weird galaxies. <laughs> um, if, you, if you look on the left, um, what you're going to see here is a plot of a bunch of spectra. So there's brightness on the y-axis and rest wavelength on the x-axis. And these are in the optical part of uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. And the reason I'm showing you these spectra is these are spectra of galaxies like the picture that I just showed you that tend to host tidal disruption events. And I'm pointing out with the green and the blue arrows some of the features that these galaxies share. And the fact that they have combinations of these features makes them weird and tell a story about the history of the galaxy. So this is work that we did um, with our collaborator, Yair Arkavi, who's shown in the lower right here. And what you see is that the strong Balmer absorption lines, which the green arrows are pointing to, these are wavelengths that are missing from uh, the spectrum of the combined stars in all this, in, 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 in each galaxy. Um, indicates that there's a strong population of A-type stars. And the reason that's interesting is A-type stars tend to live for about a billion years, a giga year. So if you see a lot of A-stars in a galaxy, the last episode of star formation had to have occurred within a giga year. But the interesting thing also is what you don't see, which the blue arrows are pointing to. In most of these spectra, you do not see strong nebular emission lines, which are indicators of current star formation, meaning they usually show up when you have massive blue luminous O and B type stars that illuminate the surrounding gas from which they formed. And we're not seeing that 
So the story of these spectra are telling us that these galaxies are transitional. They are galaxies that used to be forming stars with some time within the last giga year, but they're not forming stars anymore. And that's why I was interested in them because I'm interested in things that drive the evolution of galaxies and why some galaxies look different than other galaxies. And when you find a story in the spectrum that suggests that a galaxy is changing from a galaxy that was forming stars to one that isn't, it's interesting. But the other thing that's interesting, which I had mentioned, is how, not just how weird these galaxies are, but the fact that they tend to be the hosts of these spaghettified stars. And what I'm showing you here is another plot from a scientific paper. This was work done by my former graduate student, Decker French. What you see along the x-axis is a measure of what I was just talking about, the thing that was indicated by the green lines on this plot, whether the galaxy has had recent star formation. And as you move to the right, the galaxy has had a lot of recent star formation. But the y-axis shows whether the galaxy is currently forming stars. That was stuff that was indicated by the blue arrow on the previous plot. And by the time you get to the top here, you were talking about galaxies that are now vigorously forming stars. So galaxies that we consider red dead galaxies, quiescent galaxies, ones that haven't formed stars recently and aren't forming stars now are on the lower left part of this plot. Galaxies that are forming stars now and have been forming stars for some time tend to be in the upper part of this plot. That's what all these gray points represent. They're all galaxies. And then you can see a very, very interesting feature, a spur off to the lower right of this plot. And that is telling us that there are galaxies here, like the ones I just showed you, that have had recent star formation but aren't forming stars anymore. They're in transition. So let me go to the next plot and show you, I'm going to highlight where the galaxies are in which people have found these tidally disrupted stars. And what you're seeing in the purple and the, and the red data points again from a scientific paper is that the galaxies that tend to host these tidal disruption events are not randomly distributed in this plane. And they're certainly not distributed the way all the gray points, which are where all the galaxies are. They are in this, this spur to the lower right in which there are generally very, very few galaxies compared to all the others. So that's telling you that there's a strong preference for some reason for tidal disruption events to occur, and again, occur on parsec or subparsec scales in galaxies where the properties that I'm showing you on this plot, the x-axis and y-axis properties, are for the whole galaxy, for 10, 10 kiloparsecs or so across. So why is that? Why is there this big time statistical enhancement of tidal disruption events in these very unusual galaxies? So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that before I get to a broader discussion of other kinds of astrophysical transients gravitational wave sources and how you can help. So we'd like to understand physically why it is that there's this preference for these unusual galaxies. And to do that, we have to understand a little more first about these unusual galaxies, more than just the spectra that I showed you and the story the spectra tell about the galaxies transforming from star forming type galaxies to non-star forming type galaxies. So one thing I can tell you is that we think that the way um, these special galaxies form, and the way we refer to these galaxies is post-starburst galaxies. They're galaxies that have had a burst of star formation recently, but aren't forming stars anymore. Um, we think of them kind of as a frame in an evolutionary sequence in which two galaxies that are forming stars and have lots of gas and dust merge with each other forming one big kind of train wreck galaxy, forming a lot of stars because you're com compressing gas when you smash two galaxies together, denser gas tends to form stars. So you get a burst of star formation and you probably get a lot of winds and outflows from the supernovae that arise from those newly formed stars and maybe even from the central supermassive black hole and jets from that as well. And then we enter a phase 
a quieter phase called the post-starburst phase, which is where we're finding all these tidally stripped stars. And then we think later on that these, these galaxies are transitioning to what we call red dead or quiescent galaxies that aren't forming stars at all and will not have done so for some time. So this is a bit of a cartoon. Obviously, these are not all the same galaxies. This isn't a, really a movie. I just took some pictures of example galaxies to show you a kind of schematic as to how uh, simulations have shown galaxies may evolve from one type, the types on the left, which are star forming and have disks and gas and dust, to the types on the right, which are more spheroidal or ellipsoidal, don't have much gas and dust and have much older stellar populations. And we think our interesting class of galaxies is kind of along this sequence um, and may last for a quarter of a giga year because of those A stars. So, you know, is this sequence reasonable? Is this a particularly accurate picture of where post-starburst galaxies fit in? And then why is it that these tidal disruption events happen in them? We were asking all of these questions, and I can answer some of them for you. Um, so, for example, with regard to how they formed, with regard to where they come, came from, what their progenitors were, from, for example, studies uh, that we've done with Hubble Space Telescope and, and other kinds of, of dynamical studies, we've definitely found that there's an indication that they arose from galaxy-galaxy mergers, like was in the cartoon just now. You can see that a lot of these galaxies not don't just have funny spectra, they also have funny shapes that look like they've smashed into other galaxies recently. There are lots of tidal tails, they don't look particularly regular, they don't look like grand design spirals or boring ellipticals. Um, so we really think there's strong evidence, I'm not showing all of it, but strong evidence. Oh, thank you, the ARC catalog, sure thing. <laughs> thank you for the shout out, <laughs> I'm sure you would too, uh, via gassy galaxy mergers. Um, so we think that sequence uh, to the left there is probably reasonable. Um, and then the question is, do we see these post-starburst galaxies evolving into uh, the most boring kind of galaxies, the red dead, dead galaxies. And we see evidence for that as well. So if you take a look at galaxies that are a little further along in their evolution that have been through the post-starburst phase, we definitely see them calming down. We see their stellar populations aging and we see their tidal features diminishing um, over time. So there is definitely quite a bit of evidence that um, they do ultimately form old uh, quiescent galaxies. So we think that's okay too. Um, but then the question is, why does the starburst stop? If there's all this gas and, and dust uh, when two galaxies collide and there's a big burst of star formation, what ends it? And we had a lot of speculation about this when we first started studying these galaxies about um, conditions whereby the gas would all be expelled in these winds or consumed in star formation and predicted really that there shouldn't be any gas there. And we were wrong. <laughs> so what you see on the left here um, is also work done by my former student, uh, Decker French. Um, what you're seeing on the left are those Hubble Space Telescope images, but superimposed in green, the green blobs are um, quite a bit of um, carbon monoxide uh, CO gas. And we usually use uh, CO gas as a tracer of um, dense gas in clusters uh, in, in, in galaxies, the kinds of gas that will make new stars. So the fact that we saw a lot of it, in fact, comparable amounts to many galaxies that are forming stars in galaxies that weren't forming stars was quite confusing for us, actually. Um, so we, we questioned whether the CO gas was in fact a good indicator of the dense gas that actually is expected to form stars. And so we went to the ALMA uh, array telescope down in um, South America in Chile, and we tried to get some pictures. So what you see on the right um, are pictures um, where we are looking for even denser gas, the type that actually forms stars. It's harder to do, but we decided we needed to do it since we were puzzled by the first result in CO. And uh, take a hard look at these pictures on the right. I wonder if you, any of you see any detections. It should be on the scale of what you're seeing on the left. 
if you're throwing up your hands and saying, I don't see anything there but a bunch of noise, you're absolutely right. We did not detect any denser gas. And this kind of solved the mystery for us as to why stars were no longer forming in these objects. So there's no dense gas to make stars. Um, it kind of completed our picture as to this cartoon. And the question then becomes, well, is it this particular phase, this post-starburst phase of galaxy evolution that gives rise to tidal disruption events preferentially, or is it this whole sequence? And in fact, we don't see stars spaghettified in the other frames in this movie. We really just see them in this frame. So could, there's could you, this phase. Oh, did someone have a question? Or yeah, could you, could you go back to that last slide? Yeah. What exactly are those pictures? What What are you actually? Is it radiation? What What is it? Um. Yes. So, so that was an an, an attempt to detect uh, dense gas, um, HCN, HCO plus. We did a variety of dense gas measures, and that's radio in radio that's, light. This is a radio wave. It's sort of a radio picture. Okay. That's correct. That's correct. Um. So, um, what is it about? Uh, this phase that that generates this high likelihood of, of stars being tidally disrupted. And um, there are lots of ways in which you could imagine this would happen. You're taking two galaxies and you're slamming them together and you're making one galaxy. And each of those galaxies over here on the left had their own supermassive black holes in the center. So you may just be making a binary supermassive black hole and there are a lot of models that suggest that binary supermassive black holes are better at disrupting stars near them than single mass supermassive black holes would be. You can also imagine that in colliding two galaxies together, the burst of star formation that results from compressing all that gas happens mostly at the center. The gas is dissipative, falls to the center emit by emitting a lot of radiation, and it forms essentially concentrated huge amount of stars. So maybe you're just better at feeding the monster. Maybe you have a black hole at the center of the product of this merger, and you just put a lot more stars around it, and it tends to eat well. <laughs> um, it's also possible that in colliding two galaxies together, the stars that you do form towards the center are on unusual orbits, the kind of orbits, say, that are very radial or something that would take them preferentially close to the central supermassive black hole. We're still working on this quite actively. Um, I can tell you that there's some things that are more suggested than others at this point based on work that we've done and others have done. Um, but this is an active uh, field of research right now. And I hope maybe sometime I can come back and, and give you stronger answers. We definitely see centrally concentrated stars. That's definitely a, a viable mechanism. There's some evidence indirect evidence for unusual stellar orbits, perhaps upping the frequency of these total disruption events. Um, binary black holes definitely occur in these systems, but there's some question as to whether or not um, they could generate the rates of total disruption events that we observe. But let me get to what I promised you I would talk about. <laughs> and that is, um, in a case like this, it, it really doesn't matter uh, at some level, why tidal disruption events happen preferentially in these unusual galaxies, it is a useful tool regardless. And what I mean by that is I'm getting back to what I brought up earlier. Here's another uh, artist rendering of the Legacy Survey Space and Time Telescope, the Rubin Observatory Telescope. Um, what I said at the beginning was we were going to have a fire hose problem. We're going to have so many changes in the night sky with this wonderful movie that this telescope and survey were going to put together. And we didn't really have a good system for selecting which we needed to, which of these changing sources we needed to follow up before they faded away forever. And we never knew what they were. So one way to imagine doing that is by using connections between what you know about the galaxies that host different kinds of supernovae or tidal disruption events or gamma ray bursts. And the fact that we have that information about the galaxies ahead of time. So in the case of tidal disruption events, we know that they tend to prefer post-starburst galaxies. So if the legacy survey of space and time sees a brightening 
of a source in a post-starburst galaxy one night, well, people like me who are interested in tidal disruption events should get very excited because we know there's a connection. So even if we don't have all the details and we haven't confirmed that that change, that new bright point-like source in that galaxy is a tidal disruption event, we think with high probability it probably is uh, just because of that connection to the type of galaxy that change occurred in. And that got me thinking as to, you know, could we do that for other galaxies as well? Are there other hidden connections between the types of objects that tend to blow up or change in galaxies and the big scale properties of the galaxies themselves? Even if we don't understand the physics that actually drives those connections, if those connections exist, it's an incredibly useful classification tool for this survey. So what we've been trying to do, and these are two uh, former graduate students of mine, Chia Lin Ko and Marina Kessley, have done a lot of work trying to take the properties of galaxies that we've already measured and cataloged, people, not just us, but people all over the place have measured and cataloged, and use known cases of galaxies that have had specific kinds of supernovae or gamma ray bursts or whatever happening inside them and take those pairs, the galaxy and all its properties and the type of transient, the type of supernova, and connect them and actually use uh, different kinds of methods, including uh, machine learning methods, to see if there are hidden connections and it's possible to take the type of galaxy you have and make a prediction of the type of transient that would happen in that galaxy. So if one does, we know what to get excited about. So what you're seeing on the screen here are, are probability functions across different transient types. Now, I've only shown a few examples here just for ease of visualization, but for perhaps we know in advance, even before the legacy survey of space and time gets started, that this galaxy has a bunch of different big scale properties. We know its spectra, we know its color, we know how its stars are concentrated. And we also know uh, that historically, that kind of galaxy tended to give rise to type 1a supernovae. And if we put that all into the computer, the computer will predict that any change in that galaxy is likely to be due to a type 1a supernova. So what you see in this plot is that the computer's prediction this is probability versus type of transient. These are all types of supernovae at the bottom. Is that the bar graph is very tall. Probability is very high for type 1a supernovae. And in fact, that was correct. It correctly predicted that this galaxy hosted a type 1a supernovae. That's what the white arrow represents as the truth. Now, we keep doing this, and we can do this for all the galaxies that LSST is going to observe before LSST observes them and we can see if we would predict interesting transients. So here's another um, example where we didn't do as well, but we didn't completely fall on our faces. Here you're seeing for this galaxy over here on the left, uh, probability distribution, where we would have predicted the most likely type of transient to occur, and it is a supernova type 1b. In fact, the actual correct value was a type 2p supernova, but we were we also predicted a high probability for that. So. If, if people are really interested in this type of, of supernova, they might roll the dice and, and take a risk if we still predicted fairly high probability that that's likely to be one of our choices. We keep doing this and we're working on this and improving our methods uh, using more advanced machine learning um, and, and um, artificial intelligence techniques to see whether or not we can provide for the astrophysical community this set of predictions even in advance of transients going off so people will know how to follow things up. That brings me to kilonovae. And as I mentioned before, kilonovae are in-spiraling binary neutron stars that can produce a very, very rapid burst of gamma rays that produce gravitational waves because these are accelerating sources they produce very, very strong gravitational waves, which are kind of being simulated here in this movie. Um, and they represent um, an opportunity to really dive into something called multi-messenger astronomy. Uh, you guys may have heard that term. It's being bandied about quite a bit now. And it's a very interesting and meaningful term. What it means is it's not just about light anymore. 
So for a long time, all we knew about the sky was due to sources that emitted light or absorbed light. Um, we knew there was dark matter in part because sometimes that light gets bent in gravitational lenses, um, but it was all about the light. And then people developed um, neutrino detectors and actually had a different way of measuring astronomical sources and the processes, for example, that create uh, the, make the sun work or originated uh, from the early Big Bang at a time where the Big Bang was very similar to the core of the sun. So it was possible for the first time to measure the light and the neutrino flux for things in the universe. And that was sort of the dawn of the multi-messenger era. But now, now we have an opportunity with gravitational um, wave detectors like the LIGO um, instrument to look at a third messenger, and that's gravitational waves. So these accelerating masses are thought to form a bigger neutron star once they merge, and ultimately a black hole. And as I mentioned early on, um, the ejecta are filled with free neutrons. So that grows a lot of, of nuclei into bigger nuclei, which then decay uh, to protons and light and form new elements. Um, and a lot of gold and platinum, people always are into this. I can understand that. Literally in one of these events, it's estimated that there could be hundreds of Earth's worth <laughs> of, of gold and platinum formed. Um, the gold, some, some WAG, I don't remember where I read this, but, but some WAG calculated that the gold formed in one of these neutron star mergers um, is a hundred octillion dollars at you know market price and that's that's a one with uh 29 zeros after it <laughs> so that's a lot of gold and this ejected material glows it in it creates an afterglow which can be detected optically which will be detected um by lsst um and so if you were to combine the gravitational wave detection and the optical light detection you learn a lot about um neutron stars uh, how they they collide and how heavy elements are made so as you probably know um gravitational waves were detected for the first time in the last few years um these ripples in space time they kind of wash up against the earth and they stretch and compress the earth um in perpendicular direction and these these four kilometer arms of ligo uh there are two sites in washington state and in louisiana um, plus an experiment in Italy named Virgo and an and a ongoing coming up experiment in Japan, they actually are extraordinary measures of these gravitational waves. So as these arms get stretched and compressed, it's actually possible to measure these changes in direction, one direction, and then the other due to the gravitational waves compressing and stretching the earth and the arms. Um, and they are so sensitive that they can measure changes in scale that is one ten thousandth the width of a proton. And someone, I, I went to a talk the other day, and um, if that wasn't an impressive statistic enough, someone said that the sensitivity of LIGO has the ability to measure a, a change in width that's equivalent to a human hair at the distance of Proxima Centauri. <laughs> so that, that is mind blowing at these extraordinary detectors. Um, but here's the problem. I mean, I've been, I've been talking them up, but now I'm gonna bash them a little bit and it's not their fault, but <laughs> the problem is what is pictured on, on this slide. And that is that these gravitational wave detecting experiments are not good at localization. So what you're seeing in sort of the blue banana shape uh, on this picture of the sky, um, is the LIGO lo localization for a, an event, like a binary neutron star event. And then if you factor in a Virgo, it's kind of like a triangulation. You can shrink the size of this uncertainty banana on the sky, but it's still enormous. I mean, these bananas can be 150 moon sizes across. And that means that within them, there are literally hundreds or thousands of galaxies that could possibly be the host of the binary neutron star merger. And so as a result of that, you know, people have had to be very clever and very collaborative to try to follow up 
gravitational wave events. But the issue is that there are very, very few, at least so far, binary neutron star merger events that have been detected in gravitational waves. Most of them are when black holes collide and they don't emit like no black holes. <laughs> so you don't get this afterglow due to radioactive decay. And so um, if you really want to do multi-messenger astronomy, you have to find the point of light that has changed in some galaxy due to the afterglow. And you have to find it pretty quickly to learn about the physics of what is creating the afterglow and what happened with the merger of the neutron stars. And the issue is, how do you find it quickly when there's so much uncertainty in where it could be? So people try to look at these incredibly wide field surveys where the pixels don't have great resolution and so the sensitivity isn't enormous. Other folks try to pick off the galaxies one at a time and say, is, is there a change there? Is there a change? due to the afterglow of this gravitational wave source. Can I do multi-messenger astronomy now? Well, for the one source that was detected in, in 2017, when two neutron stars collided, it was about 130 million light years from Earth. It produced a kilonova, but the problem was because it was so hard to localize and people didn't know where they needed to look, it took 11 hours for the astronomical community. And this is after the gravitational wave alert had gone out, every telescope that anybody could grab was, was pointed towards that big banana on the sky. <laughs> um, it took them 11 hours to find this, this glowing new dot associated with this galaxy. And so much physics is lost if you don't get to detecting the afterglow, say within the first 30 minutes that it's really hard to test models. So is there a better way? And, and that's where I think I'd like to talk to you about crowdsourcing this. So the idea would be for um, our partner citizen scientists and their telescope facilities to each get assigned a galaxy within that banana to look at, but simultaneously to multiplex this. And so if we match one galaxy to one observers and we had the observers look simultaneously and we had a lot of observers uh, all over the world, uh, people who are ready to go, people who are in nighttime, people who, um, for whom that part of the sky where the banana is is accessible, um, we could make the assignments and ask whether or not you see a change in the galaxy from the finding chart we send you. So we have a website and a project called Hot Shots, and this is where you could go to get a little more information and, and, and sign up. Um, we, you can learn a little more about our infrastructure and how we would match galaxy targets to observers. And you can fill in the, your details, uh, including a little more information about the kind of setup you have and where you are, um, the kind of field of view you have. And we get, we ask for a little calibration as well. Um, how long would it take you to detect a 19th magnitude star with no filter? And that gives us a sense of, of what is possible. Do you observe in person? Do you observe robotically? Do you observe both? Um, we do have some um, ideas about um, robotic queue interrupts, if you allow them. And the idea would be to ask you uh, to target a 19th magnitude sources, sometimes a little brighter than that. Um, but that's the estimate for, for some of these afterglows. And we've had a whole bunch of people sign up already. We've had hundreds of people sign up um, on various continents ready to be part of this. And we have a lot of galaxies in the sky uh, to potentially assign you to. Uh, there are about 300,000 galaxies within sort of the depth to which LIGO is sensitive um, uh, in terms of distance from the Earth. And we're working on ways of better matching potential observers to potential targets, um, as I mentioned, through our uh, computer infrastructure. This is what an alert uh, looks like from our system. You can see on the top panel the red-orange banana on the sky. That's the LIGO alerts uncertainty. And what you see on the bottom panel are in, in red dots are those um, observatories and observers who have signed up uh, who could possibly access targets in that banana. They're in nighttime and they could also reach 
the coordinates of galaxies in that banana and then potentially assign targets. And the idea would be to even crowdsource the crowdsourcing in the sense of asking you to allow an upload of the image that you take and our original finding chart to a website that everyone would have access to, whether they had a telescope set up or not. And we would have a button that basically was a Eureka button and ask people to vote on whether they saw a change in the comparison between the finding chart and the picture that they took. And as you can see, uh, in this case, we'd be looking for something like where that white arrow is pointed, which was in fact the one kilonova, the one electromagnetic counterpart to a gravitational wave source that's been detected uh, to date. So I wanted to thank you for your patience uh, and listening to that, that story and, um, and your interest in, uh, in, in potentially participating. So thank you very much again. <laughs> thank you. I guess I should uh, stop screen sharing, right? Yep, you can do that. Okay. Unless we want to go back to your slides, if there's any, you can you can kind of keep it there if you want. Oh, why to don't you? Yeah, okay, all right. Yeah. I, Let's, I, uh, go ahead. So we'll go to the chat box. But anybody in the room here have a question offhand for for uh, Rob? Uh, you want to come up here, Rob? Because I think I've got the sure. Um, how does the emission from a tidal disruption event compared to an AGN? Oh, what a great question! Yes, and in fact, um, it's 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 actually a bit of a fight in the community right now because they can be very comparable in a lot of ways. The evolution is different in many cases though. So people have been arguing in the community a little bit as to whether or not what people have called, claimed were tidal disruption events are actually just some weird variability in an active nucleus. So just let me take a step back and describe the context here. Um, an active galactic nucleus is um, a black hole in the center of a galaxy that has an accretion disk of material. There could be gas around the, the black hole that tends to form this accretion disk. And sometimes, you know, those accretion disks, they last for, you know, they can last for, for thousands or, or hundreds of thousands of years. But they can vary in brightness in the x-ray and in other characteristics due to the fact that they're not completely uniform and things fall in and, and may in some cases even orbit through them and, and, and stuff like that. So there is a natural variability to normal <laughs> quasars or things you think of as, as active galactic nuclei. And so the question is, do tidal disruption events, are they really these these spaghettified stars that form their own accretion disk for a brief period, or is this just uh, a bunch of material that's been there for a long time that, that has changed to the point of making it briefly detectable? And um, we see there are similarities, but there are also some pretty major differences in the way the um, spectral lines evolve for tidal disruption events and the way the X-ray evolves for tidal disruption events. It evolves on different time scales. Um, there's clearly um, some sense that there's unusual shocking and a period of circularization and the rate of accretion of material onto the black hole is, is, a, is a different structure, is a different dependency than is often seen in AGN. So that was a very long-winded explanation, um, but I think there are enough differences to argue that at least some of these claims for tidal disruption events are real and not associated with your garden variety quasar. Thank you. Right, thanks. Sure. All right, a couple of hands are raised. Um, we'll go to, let's see, Chris, if you had a question, Chris Kagey. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Uh, and thank you so much. This was really, really interesting. And I, I, I am impressed with the idea of the, of the citizen science project. Uh, just, uh, Again, since you're since you are directing this towards amateurs, uh, or pardon me, non non professional, <laughs> I, I I like that turn of phrase. Um, are there are there parameters on the kinds of equipment that you you imagine would be able to contribute to this? Are there 
minimums that have that you would imagine need to be met other than just being able to see a 17th magnitude star so you you know or 19th magnitude 17th 19th. get very lucky i mean there could be um afterglows as bright as that and 17th 18th magnitude 19th is a good number so that if your system were capable of creating an image um after of order say a few minutes um, or less uh, of a 19th magnitude source, uh, and you can see it, uh, then it's probably okay. But then there's that component of being able to upload that image to a website. So is it, you know, does your image, is, is it possible for you both to receive the alert from us electronically? And is it possible for you to upload the results of your image your image. I was thinking in, in terms of is there a like is there a minimum pixel scale you're looking for? Ah, ah I uh, see. Is there you know I, mm -hmm. I, I assume if you're uploading things, it's going to be FITS format because that's the mm -hmm. standard. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, you, you can know, probably yeah, upload a thing too. I mean, or a GIF file, just something that makes a reasonable comparison. You know, the the question is, we don't want perfection to be the enemy of the good. We literally want to get a discovery image or a potential discovery image uploaded as quickly as possible. And then obviously we'd want to keep the data, whether it be in FITS format or something else, for future scientific work and also for you know any kind of adjusting contrast and things like that to look mm -hmm. a little harder. But really initially, we're, you know, can we get, can we at least find something so that we can then send out another alert to the whole astronomical community to tell people to get every telescope on that object. I mean, you'd be leading the way in this sense. If you found some change, then you immediately would be uploading that and notifying us. And then an alert would go out to get everybody looking at that galaxy. Um, now that change that you're finding may be something other than the gravitational wave source. So you're not quite out of the woods yet. You may have discovered a supernova. Right. right, because at the same time as the gravitational wave alerts go out, there might be ongoing changes in the night sky, even in a galaxy within the kind of uncertainty banana of the LIGO alert. So the idea is to make a quick census of any change within that region of uncertainty to find out what to hone in on. And you asked about pixel scale. Again, you know, if you're capable of um, detecting a point source, you know, with a few arc seconds, PSF, you know, if you're, you know, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a bad night, but you can detect a 19th magnitude star, you know, with, with, with three arc seconds worth of seeing. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good on you. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. No, just, you know, trying to, trying to gauge the, uh, you know, the ability of, of people to right. so contribute, you know, do, do, do you need to have the 130 millimeter scope or can you use your, you know, can you use an 80 millimeter and, yes. you know, run with it? Yeah, so one thing we have here is there's a, a link to a calibration. So we have some finding charts posted of different standard stars. So at, of different magnitudes, including 19th magnitude sources. So. Um, anything that, that you can do to calibrate yourself and then just tell us at the bottom of this field, how long did it take for you to be able to see in the image, the 19th magnitude star. Mm -hmm. And that's why we put that there to try to get a sense of whether the, um, equipment that you currently have is, 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 is going to do the job in this case, or as I said, you know, the other way to, to participate on this is once we get um a website up where we would crowdsource the crowdsourcing you know you can vote do the blink yep yep super and thank you very, very much well, thank you yeah that was a good question uh because i was trying to imagine how i could get a 19 magnitude yeah, star really? <laughs> and, uh, yeah that's dreamy. Dreamy. yeah that's right. dreamy <laughs> But are the are the I guess the uh, the little uh, templates that you mentioned are those after you sign up or can you download some of those? Uh, mm -hmm. No, you can see them now through the website in terms of just you know stars at various coordinates that have known magnitude. Okay. So you can take a picture of one and see how long it takes you to see it, and that will give you a sense and us a sense of the calibration for your setup. Okay, very good. Mm -hmm. uh, 
All right, George, you're up next. Um, my my question concerns uh, just what you're talking about. Um, Unistellar has citizen science stuff now. And I wonder if you, I don't know if these telescopes, they're not like the, the good imaging that you get in astrophotography, but I'm wondering if they are useful in any way in detecting these things. Because you can recognize, you know all about those Unistellar telescopes and what they can do. And I just wonder if anyone has actually looked at that. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the name of the telescopes. Are you talking about a publicly available array? I, I didn't hear yeah, it. No, it's the Unistellar Imaging Telescope. Unistellar. Okay. And they have I a citizen mean, science group that looks at mostly comets and asteroids. Now, they don't okay. take okay. the really high quality imagers that astrophotography has, but they still take images. I just wonder if anyone has looked at that because you know all about those telescopes. I mean, it's all the stuff is. Yeah, I will I, I will take a look. Um, where are they based or are they distributed? Well, they're, they're things we buy. We buy the they're a four and a half, they're only a four and a half inch telescope. Uh, but it's, it's, it's what we have. A lot of uh, amateurs now are buying these telescopes. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You said about the used yeah. model. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. I thought. I misunderstood you. I apologize. I thought you were talking about a network. We have a no. connections to a bunch of uh, non-professional astronomer networks who either observe remotely from bases in Chile oh, no. or they are connected to other. No, no. Now I understand what you meant. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the capabilities are of, of that device. And it would be interesting. We should talk further about that or get it calibrated. Thank you. I, I'm, I have another question about one of the, the spectra you showed of galaxies way back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Could you go back to that? Sure. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Achim was saying limiting magnitude of 18.2. I assume that's in visual band. Uh, all right. I'm, I'm scrolling back here. Bear with me. Here we go. Is this yeah, what you're talking one. about, George? What, what are the, these, these images all look the same. Like. You, what are the differences that you're talking about? Like well, this, that can look the same as this one. Right. Yeah, they, they all should look the same because they're the same type of galaxy. There, are, I mean, there are yeah. several differences. Some of them have a few nebular lines, which you can see on the right here. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, we picked these out because, well, I should say tidal disruption events <laughs> picked these out. These oh, are the ones that are shown kind of in this the, the next picture, which I showed here. Um, but if I go yeah. back, um, these are the hosts of tidal disruption events. And what they share is that they have these really strong Balmer absorption lines, right? And then they don't generally have these strong um, nebular emission lines like H yeah. alpha. So. Okay, I see what you mean now, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. But H alpha, we actually, I'm not even showing a wavelength out to H alpha, but, but other lines like O3 mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. Uh, anyone else here in the room? Any questions? Cal or Alan? Dr. Parks has a second. Oh, I, I want to uh, say that was a great presentation, by the way. Uh, I was wondering whether or not you track those special galaxies in radio, but have you looked at them in infrared to trace the dust? Yeah, that's a great question. We, we've kind of hit them with almost every wavelength where it's possible to build a detector. Um, some of them have some evidence for dust towards their, their centers, but not, not a, a huge amount. So we don't think, uh, at least for many of these galaxies, that there is a lot of obscured star formation that we're missing. But that's a really good question. You know, if you see a galaxy that used to be forming stars and doesn't appear to be anymore, it could it just be that what stars they're forming gets hidden by the dust that's been created and not destroyed by previous uh, episodes of star formation? And there are galaxies where a lot of star formation is obscured. Um, and if you look in the dust, like you were suggesting, you do see evidence for that. But uh, these galaxies really do appear to be post-burst. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else online? I think we looked through the chat box. Uh, some good comments there and feedback from different discussions. I don't see any questions unless uh, 
I'm missing it. So if somebody's online, you want to ask, that'd be that'd be great. Otherwise, Anne, I want to thank you so much. Uh, you've given us. I think if there ever was a club that could help you crowdsource, it's it's probably Novak. So <laughs> I get that impression. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, uh, we'll I'll uh, I'll amp it up a little bit offline, and we'll see if we can get some uh, hot hot shotters out there for you to to work with. Um, I think it's pretty cool, and um, you know I think it's a bit beyond what I can do with the 19th magnitude, but. Uh, <laughs> There's, there's probably guys, Alex and others, that can actually contribute. So. Yeah, and I can say one other thing too is that we, we are under resourced across the board on this. So if, if you have folks, and I'm sure you do, um, technical folks there who are programmers um, who would be interested in getting in and help us, you know, on a volunteer basis. <laughs> so I don't have much financial support for this at this time, but um, because we're just getting started. But I, uh, if you have programmer folks um you can make a contribution there as well so please do let me know we're, yeah. we're, we're looking for all manner of volunteers <laughs> uh, yeah thank you so much ann and we really appreciate it and the time you gave us tonight and uh look forward to helping and seeing uh, the fruits of your labors as well with all of this so uh, thank, thank you so much thank you very much it's a great talk